Win Thin is our next speaker. We're going to focus on emerging markets with him. Um, Win Thin is the global head of emerging markets at Brown Brothers Harriman, and he'll talk about the new normal. If I could ask you to come here. Hi there. Um, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm going to head right to the bar after this because I was, I'm going to try and cheer you guys up. I don't think I can do it after, after what I have to tell you about emerging markets. Um, so um, I work at Brown Brothers Harriman. We're a small privately held bank. In 2018, it'll be our 200th anniversary. So I like to think we do things the right way, the old fashioned way. Our clients are mostly real money managers. That is the fidelities, the vanguards of the world, insurance companies, pension funds. Uh, we have really no hedge fund business to speak of, no corporate business. Our niche is helping global investors invest globally. I work on the foreign exchange desk. So when we see, for, for instance, when I see a Brazilian real deal, it's not a speculator that's, that's trying to bet on where the real is going. We're basically funding a purchase, say, of, um, of a Brazilian stock or Brazilian government bond. Korean won could be buying shares in Hyundai. But our job at Brown Brothers uh, is to help uh, facilitate investment transactions across borders. Myself, as a, as a fundamental economist, my job is to help identify you know, what I would call risk. And what I see as risk is somewhat different than what I think we've talked about in the past, what it might be very different from what a multinational corporation would, would see as risk. But there's a bit of an overlap in the, the Venn diagram. Uh, I try and identify economic risks, political risk, transactional risk. We have a whole department that's basically um, geared towards just fundamentally funding the transactions. How do, what forms have to be filled out? What accounts have to be um, pre-funded in order to buy stock in, in say, uh, Indonesia? Um, we trade uh, nearly 100 currencies, foreign currencies, on our desk, on the FX desk. Um, but I can count on my, on my two hands the number of currencies that are freely tradable, that is, as any entity can just go in and buy and sell, say, a Mexican peso. Most of the time, nine times out of 10, they're heavily, what we call heavily restricted. We have um, forms that have to be filled out with the central bank or with the Securities Commission. Um, and this is something that grew out of the Asian crisis. Before 1997, the, the Washington consensus was to let, make your, your currency freely tradable. And by the way, thank you for breaking the ice. I'm going to trot around a little bit. Um, uh, the Washington consensus pre-Asian crisis was basically open up uh, free or freely convertible currencies, freely tradable, open up your capital account, that is, let anyone come in, buy and sell your currency, and everything will be hunky-dory. Well, as we saw in 1997-98, most of these emerging economies were not prepared for the massive amounts of global capital flows. That just, they just move every day. I believe... I have to check, but I think the, the latest survey, I think is $5 trillion a day trades on the foreign exchange market. It might have gone up, I'm not positive. $5 trillion a day. So we trade, we see more in capital flows in one day than we see in global trade in a year. So we've come, we, we came out of the Asian crisis realizing that, you know what, this is probably not the right thing for most of these countries. And most of those countries have, come, have stepped back. Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia have all made the currencies more restricted. That is, make it more difficult to short the currency or to, to sort of cause or lead to sort of these uh, economic crises. And, and, and to be honest, you can't blame them. And I think the IMF, what you call the Washington Census, has finally sort of signed off on this. And they recognize that, you know what? Developing economies are not equipped for these massive amounts of capital that are sloshing around. So again, the exception, uh, or rather the rule, not the exception, is, is highly restricted currency and capital markets. Yet, despite that, capital flows still go. One, our, our, I think one of our biggest um, uh, currencies that we trade on our desk is the Indian rupee. One of the most restricted markets, one of the most difficult markets for foreign investors to, to invest in. And yet, people still go there because there's a good story there. And so there's still capital movements, but I think what we're seeing is uh, more control, more restrictions. And that's something that I think has made it more difficult for foreign investors. So again, uh, my job is to help sort of help uh, people to A, decide well, what countries are good, what countries are bad, what countries you have to worry about, and, and bank as a whole is to just help facilitate uh, these sort of capital flows. So um, 
I've been following emerging markets since the 1980s. I've seen you know, the, the Latin American debt crisis, the Asian crisis, the, I think we called it the Tequila crisis back in 94. Uh, you know, I've seen it all. Um, and I think what we've seen over the last 10 years is that markets really became a little bit more, too complacent on emerging markets. There's a reason they're called emerging. They haven't emerged yet. There's still issues. So for the last 10 years, I think we had a lot of global investors coming in that just really had never seen a real crisis before in, in emerging markets. And we got too complacent. So really, emerging markets is coming off a, a really 10-year sweet spot built on four pillars. We had a weak US dollar, low US interest rates. That means a lot of capital was flowing out of the US and out of the developed world into emerging markets. Strong global growth. This is when China was growing 10, 11, 12%. And high commodity prices. You know, remember the days of oil around 150. Of course, it could go nowhere but up. So everyone bought into the story. And oil at 150 that will do wonders for an economy. All of a sudden, your current account moves into surplus. You're running budget surpluses because you're getting all this money coming in. Um, currency strengthening, inflation goes down. So it's a very virtuous cycle. But I think what many investors, and I think I'm guilty of this as well during this, is that it wasn't a structural shift. It was really a, a cyclical boom, was, uh, albeit a very extended, you know, nearly decade-long structural uh, cyclical boom. But it was cyclical. So what goes up must come down. So since 2014, we've seen, really seen the air come out of the emerging markets. Uh, we've seen the dollar come back. The dollar is now uh, stronger than it's been in a while. We'll see that chart later on. U.S. interest rates are starting to rise. All of a sudden, capital is starting to come back in the U.S. Global growth is slow. IMF each quarter keeps marking down the global growth forecast. And commodity prices uh, are suffering. Copper, iron ore, oil across the board. So, you know, this is, again, a cyclical thing. This doesn't mean it's the end of emerging markets, but we're, having to, we're dealing with a cyclical move. We're on the downside of that cycle. I don't know how long it's going to last. I would venture to guess it's going to be several years. We're, we're, we're sort of more close, closer to the beginning than the end, I think. So that gives me, I think, a lot of room to help sort of navigate. I think, you know, the easy, days of easy money are over. You know, from 2004 to 2013, you could just throw, you know, a couple million dollars here. Any country, you could just like, almost like pick it on a map, and you'd expect it to rally. Because we just had this huge commodity-led boom, strong global growth. You know, it wasn't just the commodities, because then, you know, you had China that was churning out electronics, autos, et cetera. So it was really, again, a, a sort of a nice virtuous cycle. And we're, again, we're seeing the, the, the downside of that now. So, um, you know, I, I'm... I would say I'm, I'm fairly negative on emerging, emerging markets the next year or two. I don't think it's a disaster. Um, I think the one thing that's better now than we saw, say, back in 97, 98, is that um, what they learned out of that Asian question is that fixed exchange rates are, are, are really not that good. That is, it, it's become more of a shift towards floating exchange rates because that, it acts as a shock absorber. And when you have a peg exchange rate, you're fighting to keep that peg there. All of a sudden, things turn, commodity prices collapse, say, and when that peg collapses, it's just it's disaster. We saw that in 97 when the Thai bot broke, the uh, Indonesian rupiah, Korean, excuse me, Korean won, Russian ruble, on and on. Very, very disruptive. Now, that's not the end of the world, but it's much more disruptive than when you have an exchange rate that's freely floatable, floating. That's, again, this, it's like a shock, a shock absorber. And so we've seen emerging market currencies weaken really quite significantly over the last year or two. And that's actually a good thing. It, again, it, it reflects the terms of trade movement against them. That is, the, the, the prices of their exports have fallen, so their currencies will naturally weaken. And uh, eventually helps the economy adjust. So why am I negative on the <clears throat> emerging markets? Well, we saw all those factors that I think will persist. We're seeing oil, copper trying to bottom, but if you look at the supply-demand dynamics, there's still a lot of supply out there. Saudi Arabia, Russia, they're all pumping oil like there's no tomorrow. In terms of copper, I know Peru is bringing, I think, three or four massive copper mines online this year. And that's the problem with the commodity boom, is that a lot of these investment decisions were made three, four years ago when commodities were, were booming. They sunk billions of dollars in, in these projects, and they still have to bring them online. It's, even though prices are low, it makes sense to still bring these online. So we've got massive supply overhang and you know, sort of weakish demand outlook. Uh, given what we see in, in global growth. 
So, um, you know, again, it's not, it's not the end of the world for emerging markets, but it's just making it much more difficult for policymakers, making it much more difficult for investors. <clears throat> the other thing that I think that's sort of the, the other issue to drop out there is the Fed. In the past, historically, the, the start of a, a tightening cycle by the, by the Federal Reserve typically leads to stresses on emerging markets. And that's part of the reason it's the money that flows out, out of emerging markets back to the U.S., you kind of go come back to come back home. There's a whole sort of recalibration, recalibration of risk and reward. Um, but typically, we've seen some stresses, and we saw that. We saw that last year. Um, the Fed hiked in December. We, in January and February, we saw a lot of stress and turmoil for a variety of reasons. Um, but I think much was linked to the Fed tightening cycle. Now, what's changed since then? Well, over the last two months or so, emerging markets has gotten some traction. That's because Ms. Yellen, at her March um, speech at the Economic Club, actually I was there, uh, she was shockingly dovish. She was basically saying, you know what, we're not, we don't really need to hike that fast. There's a lot of slack in the labor market. We're going to be very cautious. She said cautious about 100 times, and cautious and gradual. Uh, the Fed met the week after that in March, gave that same very dovish speech. So that's helped calm matters. Um, emerging markets have, have uh, gotten some traction. Equities have gotten traction. But I think it's temporary. Um, if you look at this chart, those lines are what you call the dot plots. That after every quarterly, after every quarter, the Fed releases what they call a dot plot, which is the median projection of where the Fed funds rate will be uh, at year end. And you'll see over time, it's, the Fed has always been too hawkish, and it, it's adjusted it several times, actually every quarter uh, since early 2015. That yellow line is. Um, the interest rates that are implied by the Fed funds futures market. That is, what are, what are markets betting on rates being at the end of the year? And if you, it's hard to tell. If you, do, if you look at it closely, the markets are pricing in one hike, one 25 basis point hike this year, <clears throat> one 25 basis point hike 2017, and one 25 basis point in 2018. Now, if you flash back to 2015, 2000, sorry, 2005, 2006, that was the last Fed tightening cycle. They hiked every meeting. So that, they meet eight times a, a year. So they're hiking two percentage points a year. That's, that's sort of what you would call a normal Fed tightening cycle. Well, we're not in a normal cycle. <clears throat> we're coming out of a very deep economic global recession. So we knew ahead of time that the Fed tightening cycle was not going to be a normal, uh, sort of quote unquote normal cycle. But I think personally, uh, and as an institution, we think this is too dovish. One 25 basis point hike per year, that's, really nothing. It's like pushing on a string. So I think the markets are massively underestimating um, the likelihood of Fed tightening. And I think there's going to be some turmoil. The next meeting that people are talking about is the mid-June meeting. Um, basically, no one is pricing in a hike then, but I think, I think there's a decent chance that they do. We'll, we'll know a little bit more tomorrow. Um, I'm sorry, on Friday, there's the jobs data that comes out for April. What's interesting is that the, the jobs market is, is still pretty strong in the U.S. Growth has is, is, is hit a soft patch, but um, unemployment is below 5%. So I think that, again, markets are underestimating the, the, the strength of the U.S. economy, the underlying strength. I'm fairly upbeat on the U.S., and I think the Fed tightening cycle um, is going to be much, well, I won't say much, but it will be more than what the market is pricing in. And that could cause some turmoil. Once that, so the Fed tightening cycle story comes back, we think the dollar will continue to rally. If you go back, this is uh, since 1980. There have been three major dollar rallies since the end of Bretton Woods, the end of fixed exchange rates. The first one is uh, what you call the Volcker rally. That's when you hiked rates up to about 20 something percent to choke out inflation after the first oil shock. Uh, this would call, we call the Clinton dollar rally. That's when we had sort of the dot com boom, a lot of money flowing into the US. And this is what we call the Obama rally, which is, I think, predicated on, on uh, a good U.S. economy, tightening in the, by the Federal Reserve. The one thing that's interesting, I might spend hours talking about this, but the one thing that's interesting that even though the Fed is only maybe hiking, maybe they hike 50 basis points a year, 75, the rest of the world is still easing. Japan, they just instituted negative interest rates. I, I, I can't even get my hands around that. They're basically paying the government for the privilege of borrowing. It doesn't make any sense to me. And there's, I think there's all sorts of academic literature that's gonna come out of this, is what are, the real, what are the real costs of negative interest rates? There's so many distortions that we've yet to really, yet to really explore. 
Um, I don't think it's good. I, I, I just don't think it's not natural. But the fact of the matter is the rest of the world is still easing. Bank of Japan, ECB, is, uh, just announced another round of easing in, in March. So the US, to me, is, is, is really like the one, it was sort of the first in and first out. I mean, they took all these really aggressive, you know, they went to QE back in, and zero interest rates back in 2008. They were the first to do that. The ECB just did um, quantitative easing um, last year. So they're a little bit late to the game. And that's why I think this dollar, the dollar should be the first to sort of come out of this. That's going to be stressful for the emerging markets. One thing, I'm sure you've read about this in a lot of the press, and, and, and it's been out there, is that a lot of emerging market corporates and sovereigns have borrowed in dollars, foreign exchange. Some people call that the original sin for emerging markets. It's that this whole imbalance in your, in your, in your sovereign balance sheet. Um, and when you have a strong dollar, and all of a sudden, it costs, if your currency weakens, it costs you 20% more to service this dollar debt. So that's something to keep an eye on. Again, I do think the fact that we have these freely floating exchange rates um, will help the adjustment process a little bit more. Um, it, can help uh, it can help companies hedge their foreign exchange risk, do some prepayments, et cetera. It's just not as disruptive as a fixed, income, as a fixed exchange rate breaking. Global growth. Uh, I touched on this earlier. So between 2003 and 2007, Global growth averaged about 5%. Um, 2008, 2009, we obviously saw the downturn from the global financial crisis. And, we, and if you look, we've really, we've really seen sort of a, a real market slowdown in global growth. That's the, uh, the red line. And the IMF is forecasting a pickup in 2016, 17, and 18. And I think it's being too optimistic. We're seeing Japan struggling. The US economy, we're not going back to 3 4% growth. China, the world's second, second largest economy, you know, we're talking about 6 6.5% six if we're lucky, not 10 12 that we saw before. So I just don't see this. And I, I think every quarter the IMF updates its, its world economic outlook, and every quarter they mark down their forecast. So I fully expect this. This blue line is, is the uh, median forecast of, of uh, Wall Street analysts. And it's a little bit more, um, I think, realistic, Maybe a little bit more pessimistic. But even that, I, I, I'm not sure where this growth is going to come from. You know, China, we know, is in a, a, a structural slowdown. It's moving from an export-led model of growth, generating 10 12%. In fact, I get asked that a lot of times. They, say, they ask, well, can China you know, make this transition from export-led to domestic consumption? I say, they don't, they don't have a choice. Global growth is, is, is sluggish. We're not going back to the old days where you can run a weak currency and export your way out of, uh, out of into prosperity. It's not, it's not coming back, at least not, not, not for the next several years, if ever. I don't want to get too, you know, I don't want to pile on the bad news too much. But look, I know, honestly, it's, it's a new normal. And it's not just for emerging markets. I think it's for the rest. It's really for the world. We're coming out of this very, very deep global financial crisis. And it's a big argument now. And I, I'm on the fence. Are we, are we forever locked into this slow growth, low inflation mode? Or can we get back to some sort of you know, robust growth that we saw you know, sort of in the boom years? I don't know. I'd like to think we can, but you know, it's hard to see where that engine of growth comes from. You know, every country you look at is, is struggling to grow, struggling with deflation, struggling with excess capacity. So it's easy to get kind of you know, downbeat on, on the economic outlook. But you know, that said, you know, I think, relatively speaking, the U.S. Looks, looks good. And I think the U.S. is going to help, help the global growth outlook, help, help the emerging market story, um, and pick up some of the slack. But, you know, again, it's not going to be easy. Okay, let's uh, talk about China. So that, that's the global backdrop for emerging markets. So, you know, not so great, right? Not great. Not horrible, but not great. Um, China. I think this is sort of the, the 800-pound gorilla in the room that everyone's always, you know, we know it's there, we know there's problems there. People have been calling for a disaster um, in China for years. You know, something's going to blow up. Um, you know, the banking system, the corporate defaults, et cetera. You know, if, I would just say this, if anyone tells you that they know what's going on in China, then they're lying, okay? Because no one knows what's really going on there. The, the, the data is fuzzy. I'm not even sure the policymakers know what's really going on there. There's so much going on there that we don't know about. We touch the surface. But what I can say with confidence is that I think they have the wherewithal 
to avoid what you call a big blow up, a big hard landing. You know, I'm not saying I'm, that's not being particularly bullish on China. I just think they have the resources, uh, they have the regulatory um, power, et cetera, et cetera, to sort of prevent a big disaster in China. So that's just the base case. I sort of say, okay, China, I can't get wildly bullish on it, but let's just sort of tuck it in the back, and you know, every now and then it's going to flare up. There's no doubt about that. People are, are nervous. It's the second biggest co economy in the world. No one really knows what's going on there. You know, we know the growth numbers are overstated. How much? I don't know. That's anyone's guess. So what you see is, obviously, you know, we, had these, like, we had these years where it was growing 10, 12, 14%. That all coincided with the, the huge commodity boom. Had a downturn from the financial crisis, bounced up for a little bit, but then since then, 2009, we've been really slowing, a secular slowdown. And again, I think that's part of the fact that the global growth is slow. China cannot just sort of you know, churn its way out of, uh, out of slow growth anymore. So hard landing, no hard landing, but a longer and deeper slowdown. I and mean, that's going to prevent the commodity story from really getting much traction. So this is just an illustrative, I mean, you know, you can run all sorts of correlations, but I just want to fill this chart up. This is basically, the white line is Chinese uh, GDP growth. You know, that's the right-hand access, uh, axis. And uh, that's the uh, price of WTI oil. So, you know, it's obviously not a one-to-one -one thing, but you can see how the China store is really a big part. You can, I, threw up, I did that with, with copper and iron ore, and it's a very similar chart. Strong Chinese growth is really a big part of this, this cyclical boom in emerging markets, and this, it's just not coming back. So risk. Okay, one thing I forgot to say about risk. As an investor, you're, you can accept higher risk, but you've got to get higher return. So that's, that's sort of the, you know, whereas risk for, say, an insurance company or multinational, it's a little different. For us, it's okay, well, you can say to an investor, well, okay, it's kind of risky, but you know what? You're going to get paid 12% yield, so you know, why not work? It's kind of worth it. So it's all about risk-reward, uh, relative value. What's the better you know, sort of risk profile, return profile? Very interesting way of thinking of things. I mean, I, I, uh, so I, I got my PhD in economics. I was very prepared to go. Uh, my father worked for the IMF, so I thought I'd go to World Bank or IMF or something like that. But I started working on World, Wall Street, and um, just sort of fell in love with this. Really fascinating. Uh, to me, a fascinating combination of economics and markets, psychology, things like that. Um, ratings downgrades. Well, this is probably something that you might be interested in if you're an insurance company, if you're a multinational. Um, so far, this is just in 2016, just four months basically. We've seen 12 negative and one positive rating actions in the emerging markets. And I list all the countries that are commodity based. I mean, a lot of these agencies are, have, are saying explicitly, these countries are going to suffer from lower commodity prices. They're not well prepared for, the, for sort of the downturn. I think the problem that we saw in emerging markets during this boom is that as commodity prices went up, a lot of these countries spent, kept spending more and more. So you have what you call these break-even prices for oil and commodities. Like, what would the break-even price need to be in order to balance your budget? And we just saw it go up and up and up. As the price rose, so did spending. So a lot of these countries are paying for it. But it's not just the bad, so what you call the bad co countries. You know, we, you know, Brazil, Russia, Venezuela, obviously South Africa are basket cases in, in many ways. But Mexico, not a bad story. Um, you know, others. Uh, now, that's in emerging markets. In Frontier, uh, just so you know, you have sort of these layers. Um, you know, you have the developed markets up here, Japan, Canada, Australia. You have emerging markets, those kind of countries. And you have what would you call now what we call the frontier markets, which is sort of if things go right, they'll sort of eventually move up and graduate into, into emerging market status. So these are countries that listed Angola, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in Frontier, we saw 31 negative and four positive, just this year, negative actions. And this comes after a bad 2014 and 15 too. I, forget, I should have put the numbers up there, but it was also very bad as well. Um, so, I think the agencies are recognizing that a lot of these commodity-dependent countries are, are going to be coming under some stress ahead, given that commodity prices may not be rebounding anytime soon. Um, I'd say the ratings could stabilize if the recent bounce in commodities is, is, is sustained, but that's still, to me, an open question mark. I actually have, I have my own rating model that I developed uh, over the years, and 
my latest one shows multiple, multiple candidates for downgrades. So it's not turning around yet. You know, again, I mentioned how high commodities, you know, it helps your fiscal numbers, your current account, your foreign reserves, all that stuff. All that's reversing. Reserves are falling, budgets are going into deficit, current accounts are going into deficit, growth is slowing, inflation is rising. So you get the idea. And I'm just going to mention a few things. I mean, again, I think I, think I have to stress that you know, during this boom, this 10-year boom, a lot of investors really lost sight of the, the real risks in emerging markets. They took it for granted that you can just invest, you get some, you get X percent return, you'll get your money out, everything's hunky dory. Um, and that's just simply not been the case. Um, you've got rising default risk. I think Venezuela is, is moving on, on the verge of default, depending on where oil goes. You've got payment risk. That is, you know, if you invest, uh, we had problems for our clients in, uh, in Egypt and in Nigeria this last year. Investors, easy to get in, but when all of a sudden you want to get your dollars out to repatriate, you couldn't do it. You had to stand in line at the central bank, basically. Um, that's payment risk, transactional risk. Um, default risk, uh, and you know, just have just general risk to asset prices. You know, if you have a coup or a terrorist attack or something, that's of course going to uh, affect uh, markets and sentiment on, on a country. So I'm just going to run through a few. Um, in Brazil, I'm sure you've read, been reading all about it. Um, for 10 years, Brazil could do nothing wrong. Part of that was based on the high commodity story, and all of a sudden, commodities collapsed. President Rousseff and the PT tried to maintain these what I think is excessive spending policies, and it, the bottom just fell out. All of a sudden, the corruption was exposed. So really, when the, 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 when the tide goes out, you really do, you know, it's that old saying, you really do see uh, you know, who's wearing swimming trunks and who's not. It's really, it's, it's, we're getting to that point where we're really seeing the really bad sort of stories in the emerging markets develop. Peru is a sev uh, second round presidential vote on June 5th um, between uh, Keiko Fujimori, the daughter of the the old uh, president, and a more market-friendly uh, gentleman, Kaczynski. Uh, Venezuela, you know, we've got the, op if you remember, the opposition took control of the Congress several months ago in elections. President Maduro is, is fighting them. Political turmoil, basically political stalemate. Oil prices low, potential default risk. Just disaster. 100, I think inflation's up to 100, 150%. Capital controls, you name it. South Africa. Uh, President Zuma is under fire for corruption. Um, apparently some political favors were promised by an influential family in return uh, for naming the finance minister. Turkey, President Erdogan, he's consolidating power. If you know this, I think Turkey is the country with the most jailed journalists in the world. Not, not something to be proud of. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. Then you have the whole Kurdish-Syrian situation. It's, it's, it's amazing. Poland, which um, you know, we used to think was a, sort of an island stability, well, all of a sudden, the Law and Justice Party just won. And they've been um, taking what you would call some questionable moves, installing cronies in the, at the heads of the state companies, uh, questionable judicial appointments, et cetera, et cetera. Malaysia, uh, 1MDB, that's the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, you probably know there's been some sort of Question about 100, 680 million dollars that somehow appeared there in the, uh, the, the, the bank account of the president. Uh, Philippines, a presidential election uh, is this weekend. Um, so these are just sort of a, these are kind of things that you just have to really, really think about. Um, and again, I think during that whole EM boom, I think people were very, very easy to overlook that. That is, I mean, I think in a sense that um, global investors did not, if you were to say um, investing in Petrobras, well during that boom, you didn't really think about the country risk, the political risk, because it was just a company, it was a brilliant company. What we find in emerging markets is that really the sovereign is still the sort of the, the overriding story, and out of the, underneath that is the sort of the corporate story. You can't just buy um, the corporate story without knowing what the sovereign story is, what's going on politically, what's going on you know, economically. Um, I think that's it. That's a mouthful, sorry. Um, I could spend, listen, I could spend hours up here talking about each individual country. If anyone has any, and I apologize, I'm gonna miss the Q&A. If anyone has any questions or issues, please feel free to email, I guess, to you, and you can pass them on to me, happy to, happy to respond. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.
thank you very much. We have 20 minutes coffee break, so if I could get you back like in 20 minutes, like 4.35, that would be great.